All right, this class is not called linear arithmetic. <laughs> this is called linear algebra. And one of the things I like uh, to say for practically all my classes is any form of math is toys plus rules. You just gotta figure out what the toys are, what are the rules to play with your toys. So math itself, thinking mathematically, which is pretty much the number one issue with most people trying to solve things in their lives. Okay, math, if we start off with, with, as a coarse space, and I suppose philosophy would argue this because they want to say that they control logic, right? But logic is a form of math. It's actually a Boolean algebra, right? And so what it is is, what are the toys? What are the things? Math is meant to model. So if we start off in logic, what it models is things that are true, things that are not true. I'm either telling the truth or I'm lying. So people argue, well, all the things that is the truth. And it's like, you know what, if I told you you passed, you hand in all your homework, you get 100%, you get 100% on your exams, you get 100% on your final, I'll give you an A. Then you do all those things, and I just give you an F. You're like, man, you are a liar. <laughs> <laughs> and to the point where what you're modeling is something that is so ingrained into something that just simply is, you feel this. It's just flat out, this is true, this is not true, I know this, right? We model things that are. And sometimes the things that are just simply, literally are, right? We can't define it. It just is. And then, okay, now that I have them, how do I play with it? If I tell you the truth and, I use the word and, and then I tell you a lie, you say, I don't care you told me the truth, you lied to me. Because this rule, and, when I put a, a truth and a lie, it's a lie. So I have a rule, I have things, they go together to make new things. And so it builds up. Starts with logic, grammar, reasoning, and then we start off with arithmetic. And so what's our toys? And how do we work about? And say in calculus, what do you think your toy is? Actually, so if you have a struggle with your toy, ask what you're doing. In calc one, what's the big thing that you start to do? Starts with a D. Derivatives. Derivatives. So that's a doing thing, right? But what is it doing things to? You're taking a derivative of a function. function. So what are the toys of calculus? Functions, but specific types of functions. And I take derivatives, I integrate, I add functions, I compose functions, I have functions for a reason, they represent stuff. So your toys and rules and we start to build it out. So for linear algebra, when we say this is a, a linear algebra, not a linear arithmetic, the difference between arithmetic and an algebra is this kind of scaling to the next question of like the words like solve or unknown or equivalent, find things. Like the difference between elementary algebra, what we normally call college algebra. What's arithmetic? What's five times seven? What's two plus four? What's 27 divided by three, right? That's arithmetic. What's an algebra? If I took 27 divided by a number and it was supposed to be 12, I wonder what that number was. Also, there's an unknown. It's like, well, I also have a word like is, like equal. It's a different type of question, same as. And so for us, when we talk about linear algebra, our toys, we might say things like matrices, vectors. But these are things that we're going to work with. But the toys themselves will be abstractualized a little bit here. And so we'll have things like, OK, what I call a matrix might be something I work with. But it is built up of other things. It's like, oh, this is a bunch of numbers that form a rectangle of some sort. But they have meanings that are behind them. And eventually, when we look at those things, like we say things like vectors will be a big part of this class. Well, what's a vector? It's just an object that has a direction and length. That way, and that much in that way. And that goes beyond dimensional space. That could be two-dimensional, it could be three-dimensional, it could be fourth-dimensional. But the word that way and that much works in all those dimensions. And those are going to be called vectors. And then we can sit back and say, well, okay. Well, we put vectors together, what are my operators on vectors? And we'll borrow some words from calculus because obviously Calc 3 is when you start to introduce vectors, right? And it's supposed to be at the end, but they bring it to the beginning because you might be taking physics at the same time. Lots of fun <laughs> mixture stuff, right? We'll go back and say, you know what, is there stuff that acts like that, but isn't that? Well, what do vectors do? Well, they do this sort of stuff. Well, is there things that kind of act like that? Well, you know what, a polynomial is kind of like that. 
So if vectors can be used to talk at like a dimensional space, like the third dimension is these three vectors and independence. Is it, well, could there be a polynomial space? Well, what does that represent? Well, I, don't, I can't show it to you. But it'd be something in my head. It'd be a bunch of polynomials going, what about continuous functional space? What about a space where the vectors aren't vector vectors, they're actually matrices, so I can have a matrix space. And it's like, well, what do we do in that? Well, let's see what we can do with that, because it's toys and rules. The rules that we do should carry through. What does it mean to combine them, like add? What does multiply mean? That's a very interesting question. We might have to leave the word multiply, which means multiple additions. Maybe it doesn't mean that. Is there more than one type of multiply? Like, and so if multiply gets caught up, let's use the word product. It does the word divide make sense? No. Because divide is like the sharing concept. doesn't seem to make sense with these things. So when we take these questions as we're doing this class, we're going to go through it and do not get confused with the fact that, oh, I'm going to take matrices and add them and multiply them, put them in reduced row echelon form, and back solve to find where these things are. Guess what? That's arithmetic rules. That's about next week, and you have to be an expert. In other words, you need to be able to add, multiply, and do row reduced echelon, you know, row ops on matrices and all these other sorts of things. Guess what? Because it's in at the end of college algebra, every one of your instructors should have done that. And so it's a tool. And we'll restudy it here at the beginning for just simply a few days, at which point we say, this is my ability, and it's a toolbox, and none of us will ever make a mistake when I need to add and multiply and subtract 1,500 numbers as I go through my problem, step by step by step by step. That's what, how many of you guys remember doing row operations on matrices in college algebra? That's a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do it, but the issue is, is like, well, I have a four by four matrix, right? And this is going to do this. I'm going to have four multiplications, all of which four additions, and that makes one element, and I have to do that 16 times. Okay. What if your arithmetic is weak? I get about 90% on my arithmetic. Oh, okay. We have like a couple hundred arithmetic steps. And we need to do this problem right. And you're about 90% on your arithmetic. That means you've just gotten a zero. Because your matrix is wrong. And I have to use it later. And that's why your arithmetic, your algebra, your college algebra, your arithmetic steps, your ability to do math, what normal arithmetic math needs to be strong. It's just the nature of it And as we go through tools. So don't get confused on the fact that as we go through this, it's not arithmetic-based. We go beyond that. It's probably the first time you've had a class where it steps to the next thing and say, oh, I wonder what's the basic element? What's the toy concept? What's the rule concept? All right. Along with this is a question of why math is considered a fundamental skill which is problem solving. Problem solving, if you talk, uh, there's a book about it, a small short book by Poya, which gets picked up, and it's the steps of problem solving, which is one, understand the problem, two, make a plan, three, carry it out, four, check. None of those make any sense at all without step zero, which he doesn't talk about, which I always talk about, which is what do you bring to the game? What's in your toolbox? If you cannot do arithmetic in algebra, there's no point in playing calculus. My, all of my Calc 1 students are either going to pass or fail at the beginning by one rule. Are you good at arithmetic? Are you good at algebra? And are you good at trig? If you are not, it's very bimodal. Your calculus is essentially for most of your stuff. Because calculus is like derivatives and stuff. It's like one step. Then you have two pages of algebra. It's like, oh, I can't, I can't remember how to factor a, a third-degree polynomial. Well, you can do that on this entire section, so all of your problems are wrong? Yeah. And so students tend to fail immediately because of that. It's what do you bring to the game? And so you have to be invested in that as you go through problem solving. It's what you consider to be difficult and large is a bunch of small problems. 
and what you have to bring in. So if you're weak right now and you know it, my arithmetic I need to get better in, my algebra I need to get better in, my trig I need to get better in, because we use all of those things in this class. My calculus I need to get better in. They're a prerequisite, which means that here's the hard part. Even though it says things like on the prerequisite for this class, math 243 with a grade point of 2.0 or better. But we're using it, which means a 70% really doesn't cut it. It really means at this point when you're using it, you need to do it without mistake. And are you invested in that background? I'll try to model it to the best of my ability as we go through it, and we'll have like, oh, do you remember that? No. All right, let's review that. So where does linear algebra come from? Why do we even have this as a subject and the toys and rules coming into being? Well, if we go back to algebra, college, which is called elementary algebra. Elementary algebra has a very interesting word, solve. If I said solve 2x plus 4 equals 3, what would you do? What was the first thing that you would do? Why? It's like, what, it's like if I'm going to solve, because there's only certain things I can solve. Like, for example, if I told you x is equal to pi, and this was a question, what number is the same as pi? I'm pretty sure the answer is pi. <laughs> well, what if it was like x is equal to 2 thirds? What would make that true? I'm pretty sure it's 2 thirds. <laughs> Two-thirds would be two-thirds. Those are easy to answer. Well, what if I did 3x is equal to 2? Well, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer. If it was a simple problem like x equals two-thirds, I can tell you the answer that's two-thirds. But it doesn't look like that. So what do you do? Well, I'll say, well, we divide by 3. But what did you really do? Here's where here's, here's comes the question of what am I doing? If you say things like I divide by 3, what you really did is multiply both sides by 1 third. Why? Well, if I do that, I make a new equation, but it has the same solution. In other words, I can take an equality and multiply things by the both. What else could you do to equalities? We can add and subtract the same thing. What could I definitely not do to equalities that would cause this thing to blow up? What if I multiplied both sides by 0? Like, for example, x equals 1. What happens if I multiply both sides by 0? What would happen? What's the solution to 0 equals 0? Well, x could be anything. Really? I'm pretty sure x has to be 1. Right? In other words, you can't multiply by the multiplicative dominator. Right? Multiplying by 0, bad. Why? It destroys. It crushes things. It's like, what was there? Gone. It's like, I needed something there. I killed it. It's gone. <laughs> I can't tell you what it was. So if somebody says, well, I did all my math, and I multiplied both sides by zero, and this is what I got. All right, you just blew up your problem. I can't help you. How do I undo it? You blew it up. It's gone. You can't undo that. So you don't do it. So we learn all those techniques. But when we had this, what are the words for multiplying by a third. What's the strict word for this? This is called multiplying a number by its operative inverse, which spits out what? One, which happens to be the operative identity. It's a do nothing. In other words, hey look, I have two x equals three. I didn't want you to multiply by two, right? If I had like, well, actually go back to it was three x equals two, right? It's like, I didn't want you to multiply by three. It's like, oh, okay, I need to undo that. Okay. I need you to do nothing by multiply by 3. Well, a do nothing is multiplied by 1. Can you make your 3 a 1? Sure. I multiply it by its inverse, which is a third. But if I put it on the left, I've got to put it on the right. There's a 1 there. I have a do nothing. x equals 2 thirds. So what we said for normal college algebra, divide those sides by 3. Subtract a 4. Well, why did I subtract a 4? Because 4 minus 4 becomes a 0, and a plus 0 is a do-nothing. The negative 4 is the additive inverse of a plus 4, and therefore it wiped it out. And I do the same thing to both sides when I say plus 4. Oh wait, so I have operators 
They're inverses that need to form identities so that I get something left alone. All of this process, strictly speaking from college algebra, where you need to go back to it and think, what did I really, really do? I undid a process to get to something to I can get, have a problem that I understand. You can't just simply say subtract four divided by why. If you can't say why, we're going to have a very difficult time going to another branch of math which does the same stuff. I did this and this. I did, how do you undo that? Well, I multiplied by that. Well, is that a thing that acts like zero? Because we're going to have a linear algebra where there'll, there'll be things that act like a zero that are not zero. They'll destroy stuff when you multiply by them, <laughs> and they don't have all zeros. It's like, boy, that's a bad matrix. I probably ought to not work with it, and we're going to have special words for it. Singular. And it acts like a singularity. It crushes everything. <laughs> it's like, this is bad. I shouldn't have worked with that guy. So we revisit all of algebra with the same words, same ideas, but using different toys with similar rules. We have to be careful about it and think hard as we go through these. So we borrow and copy all those concepts. Now, where linear algebra comes from college algebra is solving a very specific type of problem, which is a system of equations. Now, it's actually a system of, in particular, linear equations. Now, elementary algebra can deal with systems of equations, and we've done things like that, say, in calculus. A strict system of equations would be something like this. Say y is equal to the sine of x, and x cubed plus y squared is equal to 7. And then we would have that sort of problem and say, solve. And it's like, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, this here says, when is this true? Well, physically I can represent that. What does that look? What is y equals sine x? It's the sine curve, right? And it looks like this. And if I said I had x cubed y squared, if I would have x squared plus y squared, make this nice and easy, equals 4. Why? Because it's nice to be a lazy mathematician. I wanted to have a circle of radius 2. Right? You always can pick things like that. All right? And so we look at that one and say, oh, well, okay, this guy here is who's going to be that circle. Doesn't look like that, but close enough. <laughs> and then what are we looking for? I wonder where they cross. What points, because what does this represent? The solution to x squared plus y squared equals 4 is not a solution. It's an infinite number of solutions. I happen to represent it with a graph. y equals sine x is not a solution. It's an infinite number of solutions. I represent it by the sine curve. And if I say system, it says when are both true at the same time? When do they cross? And how would we solve it? Substitution, right, is a normal way of solving it. Now, if I would reduce this entire problem so We've already done things like this in trig, in calculus, in normal elementary algebra. Linear algebra is simply this. If this is the problems that you're dealing with, I don't want systems of equations. I want systems of linear equations. What do linear equations look like? Why is it called linear? They are lines. So all the graphs are simply lines. And if I would have systems of equation, the question is, do the lines cross? Okay, I mean, that's, that's the entire problem now. So we learned, like, can you find crossing lines? Can I have lines in two space? Yes. Can I have lines in three space? Yes. Can I have lines in four space? Yes. And so we can have, like, do they cross? Do they not cross? Are they parallel? For example, if I have two parallel lines, do they cross? No. So it would be a system of equations with no solution. Can they cross once? Sure. And they have system of equations that have one solution. What if there are a line that happens to be right on top of the other line? Same line twice. It's like, oh, infinite number of solutions. What if I had like four lines? Is there a place where all of them cross? No, there's a bunch of problems, but there's not one where they all cross, so it has no solution either. And so physically, systems of linear equations are just simply, hey, let's study lines crossing. That's all we're going to look at. 
And it's like, okay, well, how do I represent that? Well, in the same way as I had this, what makes a linear equation a linear equation? What makes a linear equation a linear equation is your variables all have the same power, one. And you never have a variable times a variable. Like x squared is x times x. x times y, not linear, right? And so a system of linear equations, and here's where notation comes into play, would be something, I don't know what it is, it's a number, times a variable. Well, let's call it, say, x1. It says, I don't know how many variables I have. I can't use things like x, y, z, a, b, q, r. I'll run out of letters. So what we do is we pick one and we do a sub-index to say x1 is different than x2. And then I'll have, say, a12, x2, and then a13, x3 plus, and I get a1n, xn, and it, then it'd be equal to something, say, uh, b1. Now what's going to happen here is all the AIJ and the BIs are just simply, they're actual real numbers. They're given to us, they're constants. Now that would be the first equation. Something times x1 plus something times x2 plus something times x3. Well how many variables are there? There's n of them, right? A lot of times if there was just three, I wouldn't use x1, x2, x3, what would I use? x, y, z. If I had two, let's say x and y. But I could use x1, y, x2, or I could you know, index however we want, classically, equals some sort of number. Well, what about an x1? Well, x21, x1 plus a22, x2 plus a23, x3 plus a2n, xn is equal to b2. And we keep on going to, say, a m1, x1 plus a m2, x2, go to a, m, n, x, n is equal to b, m. What's happened on this problem is this system, when I look at it, has m equations. There's m rows. These m equations, so I have my first equation, my second equation, and how I'm indexing it is I'm using a double index for my constants. Why? Because they show up rows and columns, like in front of every variable and going down. So I need to have some sort of way to separate them. So my first index just simply tells me which row it's in. The second index tells me which variable it's with. And then I have n variables. And a lot of times we look at that, we would normally call that, say, columns. If we have this, this is called a m by n system. So this is still review hopefully from college algebra. If not, let me know who you're, if you were taught college algebra here at this university, please let me know their name and I will go talk to them. Is everybody okay with how these things all kind of like work out? All right, and so any system like this is just going to be a bunch of lines, whether space. It's like, well, what's the dimension of the space? Well, how many variables do you have? There's three variables, it's three-dimensional space. There's four variables, it's fourth-dimensional space. It's a line in 4D. Can I show it? No, I can't see fourth dimension. I don't worry about it. I can write an equation for it, though. That's kind of an amazing thing about having the ability to write equations. We can leave the ability to visualize, but visualizing is helpful. You go from 1D to 2D to 3D, you draw pictures start to get an idea about what's happening, and then you say, well, what happens if I can't see it anymore? Well, what did you do in the lower dimensions will carry on possibly to the higher, and we have to worry about that and think about it a bit. So examples of stuff like that would be if I would have, say, 3x1 plus 2x2 minus x3 is equal to 4, and say an x1 minus pi x2 plus e x3 is equal to square root of 2. What's, what's the size of this system? 3 by 2. 2 by 3. Row, two row by column two. first. Remember, it always goes row column. Why rows first? Well, equations kind of matter. <laughs> so let's talk about equations. All right, how many equations do we got? So this is a, a 2 by 3 
system. Is everybody okay with that? And if I would go through it, I could actually break things down. What is A11 equal to? Three. Three. What's A12 equal to? And what is A13 equal to? What would be A21? What would be A22? Negative pi. What would be A23? E. What would be B1? <coughs> what would be B2? Is everybody okay with paying attention? In my variables, would be what? X1, X2, X3. And I could have read XYZ, it doesn't matter, right? Can you start to see where you start to reuse letters all the time in, in math? <laughs> it's like, well, did you mean E is a variable or E is the special, you know, the natural number E? Like, oh, that's a very good question. I better be careful. Is everybody okay with the concepts of it? All right, now comes the fun part. Solve. The word solve is what things plugged into this make every equality that you see true, right? That's the idea of solve, is what makes each equality true. So let's have an example system. X equals 3 halves. What's the size of this? How many equations? How many variables? It's one by one, right? And what's its solution? Is the set three halves. Are we okay with that? What if I would have the, the um, system say x plus y is equal to three halves? What's the size of this? It's one by two. How many solutions are there to this? Think of one. Think of something that you could plug into x and y where that would be. Well, let's make life easier since most people do have problems with fractions. <laughs> plug in some numbers from x and y that would make that true. Plug something in. Pick anything for x. I don't care. Negative one. If x is negative one, what would y be so that x plus y would be negative one? Zero. And so here I have a solution. I would have negative one, zero. It's an ordered pair. Give me another one. What if x was equal to two? Negative three. How many solutions are there going to be? Infinite. An infinite. Which is one of the reasons why when we draw this particular thing, right, which is when I look at that, we, have a, we would sit there and say, okay, if x is zero, what's y? If y is zero, what's x? Everyone, right? And so, what is this? I know it's a line because it's linear. I only need two points, and I can draw a line. Paul Jack. So that represents all of those points as well. So if I was over here at two, I'd be down here at negative three. It's all values on this thing. So I could represent all infinite number with a picture if I choose to. Saul says find it. So we can find specifics, we can find an infinite number, we can find nothing. But in particular, if we would look at certain problems, say for example, if we would have an n by n system, which is called a square system. Normally when you're told in college algebra, if you have five equations, you can solve five unknowns. When we say that, we really mean that if you have a five by five system, it's possible for you to have a unique single solution, right? And so it's like, so in, in a, say a physics problem, if you have three unknowns to work with, and you wanna find the unknowns, you need three equations to be able to do it. Because if you have fewer or more, it's called underdetermined, overdetermined. We'll talk about that when we review it further. But for an n by n system, what were the techniques to solve? Well, there's two that you've learned. One, substitution. What's the technique of substitution? If I had, say, 3x plus y is equal to 1, 
and x minus y is equal to 7. How do I solve by substitution? Pick an equation, pick a variable, solve for it. So, in other words, I want to know when, what makes both of these equalities true. Well, obviously, I need to have these equalities be true. So what we do is we say pick, let's pick this one right here. All right, if I pick that one, I notice that y would be equal to what? x minus 7. All right, your algebra needs to be good enough that you can do multiple algebraic steps in your head for particular problems, right? Why is this important? Because you're going to do this a lot. This is a tool. This is not this class. This is done in a week and a half, at which point we use it. It's like we're going to solve by substitution. We're going to solve by elimination. And one time it's like, well, why wouldn't I solve by using matrices? Well, maybe you look at it, and I could use substitution, elimination, or matrix work. And you look at it and say, man, this is brain dead easy if I use substitution. This is really, really hard if I use matrices. I wonder which I should pick. But you need to be able to do all three and be able to pick the, the path that makes it easiest for you. But that means you need to be able to know it. All right, but if y is equal to, to x minus 7, what does that mean if it's true here? What does it mean back to equation 1? y is x minus 7. I can replace things with their equal. I substitute. Now we actually do substitute, and we have that 3x plus y, but what is y? X minus seven. It's x minus 7. Just substitute it. For every other equation, wherever you see y, get rid of it with what it is. Now what have I reduced this problem down to? 4x equals what? 8. Eight. Which means x is? So now we know what x is. Well, how do I figure out y? We move into back substitution. And back substitution is, well, if x is 2 and y is x minus 7, so we take this back into there, and so what's y? Negative 5. Negative 5. And so my original problem has a solution of 2 minus 5 is my ordered pair that makes both of those true. And could you check? Let's go to Poya's method of problem solving. Make a plan, do the plan, right? Sorry, understand the problem. Make a plan, do it, check. Understand the problem. It's a system of linear equations. I can solve this by substitution or elimination. What am I going to do? I'm going to do substitution. Carry it out. Okay, 2, negative 5. Did it work? Plug it in. Plug a 2 and a negative 5 in that first. Is that true? Is 6 minus 5 negative 1? Sorry, 1. <laughs> I have no idea where the negative came from. And then for the other one, is 2 minus a minus 5, 7. It's true. It worked, right? That's substitution. You need to be able to do this. And the next would be what? Elimination. How does elimination work? Elimination is a technique where I can take two of the equations and put them together through normal arithmetic. Add multiples of each other or subtract multiples of each other and it makes a new equation that you can replace one of them with. And it will still have the same solution. So for example, if I just simply added these two together, what would happen to the y's? They would go away. And so I would take these two and add them together and if I just simply add, I would get 4x is equal to 8. And what happens is, really, and we have never normally wrote it, we have a new system. You would have to pick which equation did you replace. You would say, hey, equation 1 plus equation 2 makes a new equation 2. You would normally say that. And if it does that, that means that this is actually 3x plus y is equal to 1, and 4x is equal to 8. And I've made a new system. And I look at these and ask, well, can either of these be solved easily? But yeah, the second one, x is 2. Well, why did I do that? I'm allowed to take things to an entire thing. I can multiply both sides by a fourth because it's not zero. If I multiply the entire thing by a fourth, which really means I put a fourth on the left and a fourth on the right, I made a new system, and my entire new system is 3x plus y is equal to 1. And now I have x is equal to, keep forgetting my head, 2. 
I have an entirely new system, which happens to have, so one, I added multiples of each other to make a new row and replaced one of the rows. I took a row, multiplied it by a non-zero constant to make a new row. And then once I have x equals two, I have something that I look at it, hey, what number's two? Two. And then we still do the same technique, back solve. And then we go ahead and move back into back solve and I get three times two plus y is equal to one. What does that make y? Negative five. And guess what? It's the same ordered pair. All the stuff that we've known from college algebra, whether it's substitution or elimination, we need to be able to do. And the row ops of the elimination itself, and so we start to look at this and say, all right, that up to this point is college algebra. We have done nothing new at all. I have systems of linear equations. They can be under, over, like have too few, too many. We normally talk about square because that's what we normally did in those classes, right? Okay, where does linear algebra come into play? Linear algebra first comes into play when we look back at elimination itself. And we look at things and say, you know what? This 4x equals 8. If I wouldn't have wrote it that way, and I would have wrote it this way, and I had that, 4 equals 8, and I had that fourth, and I always kept this pattern like this as I went through. As long as I said, let's borrow the idea of positional numbers. The idea of positional numbers is this. 1, 2, 3. What does 1 really represent? 1, read that. What's 1, 2, 3? 123. The 1 is a bunch of hundreds. The 2 is a bunch of tens. 20, 22, right? 20, 3. If I would write... Read it. 4,200, Right? Position has meaning. As long as I don't rearrange these numbers, the number's the number. That's how we deal with positional numbers. The position has meaning. Well, if I look at this and said, let's borrow that concept. If position has meaning, do I really need to put x's and y's in those spots if I assume that this spot always means x's, this spot always means y's, and this spot always means the numbers on the other side. And let's just simply get rid of the x and the y's and the z's and just say columns matter and rows matter. If we do that to simplify our life, so we had that 3x plus y was equal to 1, x minus y was equal to 7, is that it? If we keep position, this would be 3, 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 7. Understanding that position matters. But then I have that equality means something. So it's like, boy, I probably have something that represents that. So I'm just going to put a <coughs> little line right there that means this is where the equals went. And then we just put it as a big rectangular block. It's still a system of equations, but now it's represented in what's called an augmented matrix. What's a matrix? It's a rectangular array of numbers that have, for us at this moment, a very specific meaning. It's the coefficients of a system of equations. So every system of equations can be written as an augmented matrix. Every augmented matrix represents a system of linear equations that I'm trying to solve. And we should be able to go back and forth between the two. And on this, the 3, 1, 1, negative 1 as itself is normally called the coefficient matrix. And put together with the equality of the other side is called a augmented matrix. Strictly speaking, the thing on the right-hand side of the equality doesn't have to be just simply a single row, column. It could have be a bunch. It could have a one matrix with another matrix. The important part of the augmentation is sizes you know, in terms of how many rows you have really matter, <laughs> right? Hey, the thing on the right has like four, four rows and then one on the left. It's like, that doesn't make sense because this has to be equations. <laughs> Everything on the left has to have a row on the right, 
right? So we have the same number of rows. What about columns? Well, the columns on the left mean variables. The columns on the right mean constants that it could be possibly equal to. So we'd stack as many as we want if we want to. On a strict system of equations, there's just one, because it equals a number. And so that would then mean that this is a shorthand way of writing a system of linear equations. Well, if it's a shorthand way of writing a system of linear equations, let's go back to our problem for a second and think about what we did. 3x plus y equals 1. x minus y is equal to 7. Versus 3, 1, 1, negative 1, 1, 7, augmented. What was the first thing I did on this to solve it? I went and said I took row 1 plus row 2 equals, and it became a new, row 2. So what happened? It became 3x plus y is equal to 1. 4x plus 0 is equal to 8. It became that system of equation. If I did the exact same thing to this problem, where row 1 does not change, I'm getting a new row 2. Take row 1 plus row 2. What's 3 plus 1? What's 1 plus negative 1? What's 1 plus 7? Then what did I do? I said, I didn't want an x. I didn't want a 4x. I want an x. So what did I do? I took row 2, multiplied it by a fourth, and got a what? A new row 2. And what did that become? 3x plus y was equal to 1. x was equal to 2. And 3, 1, 1. I'm not getting a new row 1. Take a fourth of that, 1. What's a fourth of 0? Zero? 0. What's a fourth of 8? 2, 2. And another thing that I could have done, I could have sat there and say, does it really matter if, if I have equation one, equation two, hey, solve it. Would it be, if I switch the order of the equations, do you think it'd really matter? It's like, no, I could switch the order of the equations. And these all of a sudden become, everything that you would do with elimination becomes a thing that you could do to a matrix. But elimination gets new words, row ops. They're row operations, things that I can do to rows and matrices, and it keeps the same system of, say, keeps the same solution to the system. 